you're getting fed from God. Now look at what happens in verse number 17. Now it happened after these things. That's the things I just told you about. After these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. We don't like that, do we? And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. We know what that means. The little boy passed away. Verse 18. Now here, understand something. Before I read this next verse, you've got to understand that this little widow woman was in the same area, Zarephath, in Sidon, the home of Jezebel. It's a pagan area. They do Baal worship. She is not an Israelite. She's not Jewish. She's not a God chaser. She's just a lady helping a prophet. So she's not born again. She's not a child of God. She's a little lady who he's, who's helping him, and he's helping her. And look, and, and she just lost her baby, her son. I've heard many people say that the greatest loss you'll ever have in your life is to lose a child. She's lost her husband. Now her baby, her boy is dead. So what, how does she speak? She speaks like a hurting person. You ever heard the statement, hurt people, hurt people? Well, she gets rough, and she lashes out at him. And she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Why did I let you in my house? Right? What am I doing around you? Listen, this. have you come to me to bring my, rem- to my sin to my remembrance? Remember, she's not a child of God. So he, she said, are you trying to put my sin in my face and to kill my son? Now, she didn't mean it, but she's so upset, she's so broken, she's accusing him of causing her son to die. But thank God, what what did Elijah do? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. I wrote something down this morning when I was... I was praying about this. The Lord gave me this thought. When he said to her, give me your son, what God said is he, Elijah owned the moment. He didn't try to talk her out of anything. He just took the moment and said, give him to me. And he took him to his bedroom. Not the boy's bedroom, Elijah's bedroom. And he laid him on his own bed. He took him to the place where he sought God. He took him to the place where he rested. He owned that moment. And then, listen, he begins to cry from his heart. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? Now, I understand, that's not a biblical prayer. He's talking from his emotion. God don't kill people. Now, you say, well, what about in the Old Testament? Some of the times God will understand. God just, all God has to do is take his armor protection away. There's no safety. God didn't kill that boy. God didn't kill that boy. But the man of God is so overwhelmed by the pain of this sweet lady that's helping him that he's talking out of his head. And, and, and so he's, he's talking out of his own personal heart. So he says, by killing her son, verse 21, here's when he gets in faith. And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Oh, that's good. And the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Here comes the good part. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah says, See, your son lives. I was reading in uh, our book, Chase the Lion, and, and one of the things that they said is with every story, every good book, every good story, there has to be conflict. There has to be some kind of, of time where things get bad. And a great movie, have you ever noticed in every movie, it starts out pretty good. You know, the cowboy rides into town, there's not any problems. But then the ranchers are mad at the farmers. And they bring in a hired gun and there's this great time where it gets some conflict. And then they resolve it and then he rides into the sunset. That's the Westerns I watch that my kids get so bored with. But that, that's how they end. He rides off in the sunset. Sometimes he gets the girl, too. It's even better. But in this story, they're at the good part. They've had the bad part. Her, baby bo- her boy, her only son, dies. The man of God is confronted with it, and he's broken. And then he prays, and God raises him from the dead, and he brings him back. 
And he gives him to his mom. But in verse 24, God showed me this this week. And I, I understand, I've read these verses, preached this. I've been doing this 41 years, so I've read this a lot of times. But I never saw what I saw this last week like I saw it. And it got to me. And, and, and the Lord said, I want you to talk to your people about my people about it. Because in verse 24, it says, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now, by this I know that you're a man of God. And that the word of the Lord is in, in your mouth is the truth. Now, he came to her house. She's getting ready to uh, make, a, make a cake, eat the cake, wash it down with some water, and sit there and die, her and her son. But because he comes and says, make me one first, all of a sudden God touches her flour bin and her oil bottle, and they've been eating, and God's been reproducing the flour or, and the oil. And here God's been doing supernatural supply in her life. And she says to him, now I know you're a man of God. He'd been living in her house. And she didn't think he's a man of God. I thought, God, what's that mean? The Lord, the Lord said, sometimes just because someone says they're on your team don't mean they're on your team. Sometimes because somebody says they believe doesn't mean they really believe. They just believe. And, and let me tell you, hardship, conflict, disappointment, tragedy is the sifting tool to find out who's got it and who don't have it. You say, what? God's going to take you through things. And it's through those things you go through, it's going to reveal that either you really love Him and you really believe in Him, or maybe you don't. I've been, like I said, I've been doing this a couple years. I'm, I, it's not my first rodeo. And I've been pastoring a long time. And I've seen people come and people go. I'm looking here at the Whitakers. They were with me in, in, in uh, Family of Faith up in Charlevoix. And some of the folks that I thought I had them, and they thought I was the greatest preacher for a while they ever heard in their life, which I agreed with them, you know. But they thought I was really good. But it was just as easy to say I'm really bad and walk away as it was to walk in. You've seen the same thing. You've seen people that came to this place and said, I found my home. And I found my place. And one thing happened. It could be the loss of a job. It could be a conflict. It could be a, a little argument. It could be maybe we didn't do it the way they like it. And the first thing you know, whew. You, used to, you ever remember? Some of you folks remember Hee Haw. They had a song and. You were gone. Yep, I love it. <laughs> that was part of the, you know, I searched the world over and thought I'd found true love. You met another and <laughs> you were gone. Amen. And I tell you, <laughs> they're gone. And you go, what in the world happened? And as a pastor, and, and I was, we were meeting this week with our bishop, the state council, and, and our pastor was, our, our bishop was saying that all over the nation, there are pastors beating themselves up because their numbers are going backwards. Churches that used to be packed out are half full. And the pastors are saying, what am I doing wrong? What in the world am I doing wrong? And, and, and he, he said, what we're learning is this just a change in our world to where, to where at one time the regular attender was every Sunday now they believe between two and three times a month is your regular. Where pe I mean, it's just the way it is. But he says we have to embrace the day. That's why we've got phones aiming at me right now. Because we understand there's folks that will tune in online. And what we find out is they can even give. It's pretty cool. They even give from online. And, and what we have to do as a church is understand that, like I said, everybody that says they're on your team is not necessarily on your team. Everyone's not convinced. Finally, it took a mighty manifestation of the power of God to cause her to really, truly believe Him. Cake at night, supernaturally produced, didn't do it. But when He took her son, carried his dead body upstairs, prayed over that boy, and came back down the steps with a living child in his arm. She said, you're real. Can I tell you, there's a whole lot of people, maybe you're sitting here right now, 
or you're watching online, and, and, you're, and you're right there, you're, you're at that valley of decision, you're not sure, is this real? Or is it just a nice thing? Because, you know, everybody's uh, declaring to the church, oh, they're full of hypocrites, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and is that preacher real? Or is that story in the Bible real? And what, what we've got to acknowledge is that we are no longer living, now don't take this wrong, but it's the truth, we're no longer living in a Christian nation. This is a post-Christian nation. And in our, young, in our younger generation, we have about 35 to 40 percent who say that they are agnostic or total atheist and do not believe there is a God. So we're not in that place where everybody believes anymore. We're in a place where there's a few that believe, another group that kind of believe, and then there's many that don't want anything to do with it. So, but how, how do we convince ourselves that our God is real? How do we get to that place to where our faith is unshakable and no matter what others do, no matter what occurs in our life, how do we get to that place where we have total convinced faith? That's what I want to talk about today. So... I want, you, I want you to go with me to Hebrews, or look on the screen, either one. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to talk about Abraham. Because if anyone, if the Scripture calls anyone the champion of faith, he's called the father of our faith. And every Christian or Jew or Jewish Christian is a child of Abraham. We're either engrafted in through the born-again experience or through bloodline. And in Hebrews chapter 11, that's the faith chapter. So if we're going to talk about faith, I think we should be in Hebrews. But in Hebrews 11, verse 8, it tells us the story of this man called Abraham. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Now, these first few verses I'm getting ready to read are what I call the phase one of Abraham's faith adventure. Phase one. It kind of would be like episode one of Star Trek, or not Star Trek, Star Wars, episode one. Uh, this is the first episode. This is his first phase of his faith adventure. And it all began by faith, it says, he obeyed. Faith began with him through obedience. Can I tell you, that faith is about obeying God. Now, if you want to get your faith to that place where you really, really believe Him, it's going to start with obeying. And he, he was confronted. And, and what did God say? you got to leave here. Remember the story of uh, Genesis chapter 12. God says, leave everything and go follow me and go where I tell you to go. And he obeyed. So, and, and listen, it says, not knowing where he was going. Isn't that scary? It took me a, lo a long time to trust my GPS. And I, I tell you what, it, you remember it first started out with these uh, MapQuest. Anybody remember MapQuest in the olden days? There's this thing called MapQuest, and you go online, and it prints you out these directions. Well, we trusted MapQuest, and we were going to this wedding in Canada. What I found out on the way well, when I got to Canada, that MapQuest didn't know nothing about Canada. And I got there, and we were right on the verge, of going into Toronto, which is a big old city. And we're going into Toronto, and it says, take this exit. Guess what? There was no exit. It did not exist. Yes, there was this highway that ran under the overpass, but unless we jumped off the road, did some, you know, Four wheel and stuff. That's the only way. And so we, got, we were stuck in a downtown Toronto going, where do we go from here? Oh, MapQuest, this stupid piece of paper don't know nothing. You know? And, and, and that was scary. Not knowing, because we thought we knew where it was going. Another time, we, our GPS, Carla, tell you, just a few years back, we were in our nice Acadia, had a built in GPS, and it says, turn here. Well, I thought, I'm coming up 75, heading north, coming back to Charlevoix from downriver, Detroit downriver. And I knew that sign said, Bridge to Canada. And I thought, why is it telling me to take the bridge to Canada? 
The other, if I go straight, it says Flint. And I thought, I want to go toward Flint. But I said, it's, it says, turn, turn, turn. So I turn. I end up on the bridge to Canada. Can I tell you what you find out when you get on the bridge to Canada? You can't get off. It's one way. It, you, you're going to Canada. <laughs> and I'm going to Canada not wanting to go to Canada. Had no desire to go to Canada. And I'm in the middle of this thing. Traffic's in front of me, and I'm in one way, and I'm stuck, and I just pull over and think, and put on my flashing lights, and we're going, what are we going to do? <laughs> Finally, this guy in a pickup truck said, did he make their own turn? Yes, I did. Will you lead me out? And he led me down this secret passageway, didn't he, Carla? And got us back on I-75. And what I'm telling you that is, I thought, I, I didn't know where I was going, and I just trusted that GPS. And God says to Abraham, I'll be your GPS. You don't know where you're going, but I'm going to take you there. And that's a big test. Some of you are in that place, you're following God, and you don't know where you're going to end up, and you don't know what's going to happen next, and you're saying, what's going to happen next? I'm just trusting God, and God said, follow me, and I'll lead you. But he hasn't shown me a sign in a long time, but I'm in the middle of this thing. That's where Abraham was, obeying. That was the first phase. in the first. But look at what he says in verse 9. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So by faith he obeyed, by faith he also dwelt in the land. Now what's that mean? We're, we've got to be in the world, but not of the world. We've got to live on planet earth. And I met some church folks, I think they're living somewhere other than planet earth, because they're kind of out there. But here the, here's the deal. We've got to dwell. We've got to live our life in the middle of a place that's not our home. When it talks about Dwelling in a promise in a foreign country is saying that he's living and serving God and chasing God, but he, he can realize he don't fit in. He's in a tent, and he feels like a foreigner. Faith's going to put you in places where you just can't say you fit in. It's kind of, I'm here. Now, of course, some of our congregation are in tents this weekend, you know. Uh, that's a thing you do in Michigan. I don't get it. I don't camp. Uh, I want someone to come make my bed when I go out the, and fix it for me. I like continental breakfast there. I don't want to build one on a fire. That's just not me. I'm not a camper. You help yourself, and I'll bless your camping. I just won't go with you. Uh, I like the residence in, man. That's cool. That's my kind of place. But the thing is, he's whether you're in a hotel you're in a tent, you're in a trailer, or a motorhome. You're not home normally. Abraham wasn't home, but he knew he's in God's will. Let that sink in for a second. There's going to be times where you are somewhere dwelling in life, where you know it's not your final destination, you know it's not your ideal destination, it's not what you've been praying for, but here you are, and you're dwelling. Right there. Because God put you there. The will of God takes us off some exits. The will of God has some detours sometimes. The will of God is going to take us places we never ever saw ourselves going. Right here. I'm pastoring this church that I never saw myself being here two years ago, five years ago, definitely not 35 years ago. And here I am. But I'm in the will of God, and I'm here by faith, and I'm going to make the best of it. And what we do is we determine in our heart, I'm going to make the best of this time I'm in this spot. It may not be the spot I'm headed to, but I know God's got me here, and He's with me, and I'm going to follow Him, and I will get to that destination. So He dwelled in the land. Give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 10, it gets tougher. This is still phase one. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. First thing he did, by faith he obeyed. Secondly, by faith he dwelt. Thirdly, by faith he waited. <sighs> Do I have any good waiters in here? Waiting. I heard you, Amy. I'm in it with you, girl. Uh, drive throughs 
I feel like it should, if, if, if they call it fast food, it should have some semblance of fast attached. Right? I don't want to eat fast food and get it slow. If I want to have to eat fast food, I want it to come fast. Right? We get so impatient. I, I, I'll be a little transparent with you. Went to the bank a couple Mondays ago up to Huntington. I'm going to deposit some money. And, and to my surprise, there was a soccer team from Northwood uh, University. I guess that's who they are. They had Northwood uniforms on. And, but the, the weird thing was they all sound like they're from England. And I thought, does it Midland ship in their soccer players from Europe? I'm not sure. But there's like 12 of these guys. And they are typical 19-year-old jocks, super obnoxious, acting goofy, and all in line, and acting like it's their first trip to an American bank. And maybe it was. And I mean, it was a... I've been there like 15 minutes, and they got through one kid. And there's still like 10 of them ahead of me. And I'm standing there. I'm thinking, this is my day off, and this is not where I want to spend my day off. And my impatient self realized there's also a second location of Huntington Bank. I left the one on this part of Saginaw, and I drove down to the other end of Saginaw, and I went to that one. Why? Because I was tired of waiting. You ever got yourself in a place where you're tired of waiting? And when it comes to a prayer, you pray, and you stood on a verse, and you prayed it, and you believed it, and it hasn't come yet. And can, can you identify with me, church? Sometimes we get tired of waiting. Amen. But it takes faith to just wait on God and just trust Him. That's what he had to do. By faith, he waited. Now I'll read a couple more verses. This is, this is going pretty good. You with me? Amen. Poke your neighbor say, it'll get better. Hang on. <laughs> Verse 11. By faith. Now he gets his wife. See, this is a family thing. Abraham's doing things by faith. You ladies, you're included in this. By faith. Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, by one man and him as good as dead. What a great compliment for Abraham. He's alive and he's as good as dead. That's what happens when you get those senior discounts. Uh, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now, let me get to Sarah here. Sarah, by faith, his sweetheart, his wife, the woman who was partner in this promise, by faith, she received strength. Now, her strength had to be an inner strength to believe God that God could make alive a womb that had never been alive. But, but you know what? It was more than that for her. She received strength in here. Because remember, if you want to go back and read, when she heard the angel of the Lord telling Abraham, this time next year, you'll have a baby, and she overhears it, she starts cackling and laughing. Because she looks at Abraham, she thinks of herself, and it cracks her up. I'm not going to pick, I'll pick on Kim. If a prophet of God came to Kim, now you're still alive and well, but you're going to have a little baby at your house this time next year. Kim, Kim's going to say, uh-oh, no, 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 no. And see, she just overhears it. And she interrupts the announcement with this belly laugh. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I can see it on your faces sometimes when I begin to talk about what God has shown me for this community and the way that I want us to impact the city of Midland and how I believe that God was to pack this house out with people seeking God and lives getting changed and then we go out from here. And some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I know. Every other pastor said that too. But I tell you, I know what God's shown me. He gave me a vision. And, and he gave it to me, and I did not know he was preparing me for here. But I had the vision when I was in, in Charlevoix. And God showed me the church. 
and, and he showed me the way he wants the church. And how I saw the church, is, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Jeff and, and John here. It's, some, it's easy, it's nothing embarrassing. But in the vision, I would, it, would say I saw Jeff sitting here. And here's Jeff, but all beside him are all these people that i never seen before. And I look back and I see John, and there's like a whole row, and I think, who's all those people? And in the vision, I, I say, who are these people, Jeff? And, and, and Jeff would say, they're all the people that I went to the Lord this week. And they needed a church to go to. And they said, where do you go? And I said, I go there. I said, well, if you go there, it's good enough for me. And they showed up. And I, and I went to John. I said, John, who's all these people? He said, these are people I went to Jesus this week. And, and they said, uh, where do you go to church? And he says, I go there. They said, well, if you go there, it's good enough for me. So I'm going too. And it was like the entire house, they'd be like, here's Ashley and a row. And then here's uh, the Whitakers and a row. And then here's UK and a row. And it was all through the, and the place was full, but there was a scattering of people I knew and a whole packed house of people that I never saw before. And everybody was there because the one, a person had won them to the Lord and like a domino effect, they'd won others and they all showed up together. And it hit me. That's what church is to be about. It's not about you get a preacher good enough that it goes through town. That Man, they got a wham, bam, super good preacher at, at Jefferson. You know, I was going yard sale the other day, and, and, and I talked to this lady, and, and I said something about church. She says, I thought you looked like a preacher. I said, oh, I, I'm at North Point. And, and, uh, and I said, man, they got a great preacher there. Didn't impress her. She didn't laugh or nothing. She just looked at me like, <laughs> kind of rolled her eyes like, yeah, all right. And here's the one that really got me, her husband gets, says. And I mean, this is on, what, Capitol? Just, I mean, it's down the street from here. He says, where's North Point? Yeah. I said, you know, that, uh, that one, all, of course, there's churches all over that street. Which one are you talking about? Uh, we are Church Street, Jefferson Avenue, Church Avenue. You know, if we were really, not this is a little extra. If these church, if we could all get a hold of God, demons would be scared to take Jefferson Avenue. Because there's enough churches, I'll be, they ought to say, I'm, I'm going around. I'm not going down Jefferson Avenue because that's where all those churches are. Yeah. But what's crazy is he didn't even know where we were. We've been here since the 70s. But in the name of Jesus, not much longer. People are going to know we're here. People are going to know we're here. And, and, and when Sarah heard the promise... It made her laugh because it was so far-fetched and so out there. But God gave her strength. He gave her strength to believe God. He gave her strength to not give up on the promise. Can I tell you that by faith, ladies and gentlemen, there are going to be times where you cannot walk in your own strength. Right, Karen? But God comes down and He gives you strength and He builds you up and He stands you up when you feel like you can't go another inch. And God just does it. God just does it. And you get it by faith. And that's how faith life is. His journey was a journey where he had to obey God. His journey was a journey where he had to dwell in a place he didn't feel comfortable. His journey was a place where he had to wait on God. His journey was a place where he and his wife needed strength. But that's just the beginning, guys. I'm going to land this plane in just a minute. And I'm going to continue next week. But let's skip down to verse 17. Because in phase two, it gets tougher. Can I tell you what? I'd love to be the guy, smiles real big, and says, you can do it. Life is good. There's never a single bump in your road. People say that's never been to Michigan, right? Michigan kind of has smooth spots in between the bumps. That's how we are. We have a couple filled places in between the potholes. And that's life. And if you live for him, it's going to get, can I tell you, it's going to get bumpy and there's going to be tests. But understand something. I was talking to Zandria about driving. And she said, I'm just about finished up with my driver's ed. Now, driver's ed is pretty cool. They didn't have that back home. They just gave us a car and said, go drive. But uh, 
Up here, you all have driver's ed, and, and the people in Tennessee needed driver's ed. A lot of you ride with me think I needed driver's ed. But the whole idea is you go through all the classes, and then, oh, thank God I just transferred my license from Tennessee years ago. I have not took the test because you don't want me to parallel park. I pull in. And I'm waiting to buy a car that will parallel park for me. But the test comes. It doesn't matter if you're left-handed or right-handed. You're going to have a test. In or outie, right? You're going to have you a test. Tall or short, boy or girl. You go, if you're going to get the license, after all the instruction, there's going to be a test. And the whole idea of the test is to see if you can really drive that car. And I ought to keep looking around some of these people in town. I don't know if they don't have a license or they got someone else to take the test for them. I'm not really sure. Red light doesn't mean red light with just everybody. Uh, you're getting ready. Whoop, there you went. Whoa. But look at what happens here. Like I said, I'm about to park the plane. So we're circling and listening to the air traffic controllers. Holy Spirit. By faith. Here you go. By faith again. Abraham, when he was tested, he had a test. You're going to have tests. And they're not going to be the kind of test where you have all the answers and it's so easy, you could, it's going to be a test. He offered up Isaac. What was his test? God says, take, take your son and I want you to take him on the mountain. And sacrifice him to me. There's that obedience test. Trust test. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He went up there to do it. And uh, verse 18, of whom it is said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So he knows that this is the promised son. Con look at verse 19. Concluding. That means he had made up his mind. I like the King James, it says accounting. He knew that God was going to do this, concluding, hear this, that God was able. Mm. All that he went through up until the time of the test was to get him to the place where he was convinced, Karen, John, that God is able. You say, why do we go through what we go through? God's getting us to that place that when the test hits us, we'll say, God is able. We'll know it. God is able. See, you say, why did he say God is able? It says he, was, he knew that God was able to raise that boy from the dead. And we know it because in Genesis, he says to his servants, wait here, me and the boy are going to go worship and we'll be back. They're walking up the mountain, and his son says, Dad, we got everything, but where's the sacrifice? You know what he says? The Lord will provide a lamb. He was sure that God was able. Can I tell you, the whole point of your faith journey, and I'm just getting started in this message, so we'll be back next week. <laughs> I don't know about you, uh, Whitakers, but we'll be back, Heber. You come back if you want to. But uh, the, whole, the whole plan of God, from the day you say, Jesus, be my Savior, is to shape our lives, to arrange events, to convince us beyond a shadow of a doubt that our God is able. Because sooner or later, hear this, guys, sooner or later, every one of us are going to have to know that God is able. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my in-laws for just a second. When Greg had that terrible accident and nearly lost his life, you were coming to this church. Brother Allen was your pastor. And Gre Greg's laying there in a coma. And you don't know when he's going to wake up. That's one of those times when you better know that God is able. Right? And Greg's alive today. But that was a touch-and-go time for you. 
All of us have those. Sometime, you're going to be faced with an issue where you got, you got to say, he's able, or you'll be like the little woman. You're not convinced. And you'll find your faith faltering. You know what my job is here? To help you get to that place where you are, that you are convinced that he's able. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that I had this chance to just teach your word a little bit and say some things you put on my heart. And God, I pray that every single syllable that I gave was the right one. Because God, I don't want anyone leaving here saying I didn't get what I came for. Because that's you're, you brought us together so we could get one more victory that cements in God our faith in you that we are just convinced that you're able and Lord may these people that hear me today these that are watching online these that are in this room may they be that may they begin to to find true conviction totally convinced that you're able in Jesus name amen Amen. Jeff, God's able, man. I heard you came in, you said it's been a tough time, but God's able. And you're going to pass the test.